So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Cigarette 2017 Web Jailbirds of the Feather session. Uh, we're glad to have you here, and uh, we're the members of the Web, some of the Web Jail Working Group members. Uh, my name is Ken Russell, I work at Google. This is Shen Yang Mo, also from Google, and Jeff Gilbert from Mozilla. Uh, please come and find us during the Kronos after party because uh, we're happy to answer any of your questions, discuss anything Web Jail related with you. And we're probably not going to have time to do that in this BOF because we're going to cram it packed full of presentations, 10 presentations in one hour. Let's see if we can pull it off. So. Okay, so uh, the big announcement, as I'm sure that you all know, is that WebGL2 has finally arrived. Uh, it arrived first in Firefox. Congratulations, Jeff, for by, by about one day. Uh, <laughs> and it's, um, it's shipping in Chrome as well uh, as of this past January, and we've continued to refine it. It's on all the desktop platforms. It's on Android so far. It's already received, it's already gotten about 50% market penetration according to uh, Florian Bush's WebGL stats site. And more implementations are coming and we're, we can't pre-announce other uh, vendors' work, but work is actively ongoing here. So um, when WebGL2 launched, Mozilla did a great bunch of work, collaborated with Play Canvas, whose work you'll see later today. Uh, they put together a great blog post on the WebGL2 new features. They put together a fantastic demo called After the Flood that you've probably all seen already, but these slides are already online, so you don't need to worry about, you know, where do these links go? You can already peruse these on your own device. You can already run these demos yourself, and they all are very nice, fast, and portable. So uh, Unity and, uh, and Epic Games have also integrated WebGL support into their engines, so you can export to HTML5 get your work right on the web. Uh, I'd like to briefly show you that the Epic Zen Garden demo, which was originally designed, I think, for the Metal API, is working really nicely. This is in, you know, with great thanks to, uh, to Yuka Jelanki in particular from Mozilla, who went to Epic Games and sat there for a week to get the HTML5 code path rendering using WebGL2. So, you know, really beautiful stuff. You can already run this on your own laptop. These are linked from the, uh, from the slide deck. Unity is showing that they can do their uh, linear color rendering from the web. So this is about a 13 meg executable, I believe, Christoph, including assets, something like that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have put you on the spot. But um, so, so the leading edge post-processing effects that are already in the Unity engine can be exported to the web today with their top of tree builds. Um, there are many other vendors that are doing really cool interactive stuff. Uh, this is um, Plus 360 Degrees' car configurator, you know, totally cool. Uh, maybe not quite comparable to the real-time live, uh, you know, thing that we saw yesterday, but still looking pretty good. And this runs on mobile, so uh, that's, that's a major plus. Uh, folks are doing uh, interactive experiences for Valyrian and for other, uh, other games like For Honor. And, uh, and, you know, enthusiasts are just making uh, cute little demos that, uh, you know, that are SIGGRAPH related, for example. And if we give this one second, you can see it's welcoming you to SIGGRAPH. So, um, Again, all these demos are already uh, in the slide deck. You can view them, don't, uh, don't worry. We have a lot of people to thank for this major release. Uh, too many to thank right now, but um, it wouldn't have been here without you know, the uh, collaboration from dozens of people at multiple organizations, and we're gratified to finally have this uh, upgrade in web technology available to you, and we can't wait to see what you do with it. So, we have an amazing speaker lineup. Uh, I'd like to please invite the Shader Toy folks to come up first because they have a, another boff to get to. Uh, but we're going to try to get all these presentations in in 50 minutes or so. And so let's see how we do. Um, I'd like to point out, Patrick, could you, uh, could you come up? Sure. Thanks, Ken. So very quickly, I'm super excited to say that the book, Web Joe Insights, is now entirely free online. Uh, let's see. So it's a PDF, it has some of the most advanced WebGL content uh, that, that I'm aware of, lots of really great authors, and I would very briefly like to ask anyone who is an author for WebGL Insights if you could please stand up. 
There's a few. I know Ed is here. You know these guys. Very nice. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. And, and thank you, Patrick, for, for putting this book together and for organizing us and rallying us around the, uh, the cause. So again, don't forget, there's an after party tonight at uh, 5, oh, it's 5.45, okay. Uh, in this area, please come back. There's free food, there's free beer if you drink beer, um, and free conversation with a great community, and uh, we can't wait to hear what you're doing. So with that, can we please have the Shader Toy folks come up, and let's, uh, let's get this party started. All right, so we have literally five minutes, right? So for uh, okay, so four minutes and thirty seconds to cover how uh, well who we are. So this is uh, uh, Shader Toy. I'm Paul, and uh, he's Inigo. We are the co-founders of Shader Toy. We started this uh, quite like in 2009 or 2010, I think. Wait, uh -huh. no, or 2013. 2013, but your first version was 2009. Um, yes. Uh, and in Shader Toy, we basically um, are a platform for people to just upload shaders and uh, fragment shaders to be more specific. And we started with just like one pass fragment shaders, and, and then over time, we've been extending the APIs to support multi passes, but also to support the generation, procedural generation of, of audio. And we have video and textures and all sorts of stuff to provide a way for people to create content and then share it, and hopefully other people will learn about it and then share it and then so forth, so forth, so forth. So we kind of just are a speaker for the community, and, and today we're here to uh, cover a little bit of our transition to uh, WebGL2, which has been super, super easy. And, and we wanted to, we brought some uh, visual um, examples as well as, um, as some content. So I guess. Um, I can take over. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, so basically, users generate all this shader code. Um, they publish it as it is, and that makes the images. So when we transitioned to WebGL 2.0, uh, we no longer had access uh, to GL frac color and few other things which were native to uh, GL 1. Uh, so in our case, it was pretty easy to transition, and we have like. Like I think it's 50,000 or 100,000 shaders in the, in the database, but the conversion was easy because we never let the users write directly to GLFrag color. In anticipation of what's coming, what was coming, we kind of uh, let only the users create their shaders within a small sandbox, uh, so they never had to use GLFrag color or anything like that. So we only had to change the decoration uh, uh, shader code that we have internally in JavaScript. Uh, so that, that part was easy, but then... Oh, and, and just to add to that also, that, that uh, abstraction that he's talking about also enabled us to, to support um, early on uh, WebVR. Correct. Uh, so yeah. That was good. Um, yeah, it also makes it work in GLES 2 and 3 for the, for the, for the yeah. I, I, yeah, iPads and iPhones. So the thing that was more difficult to transition was the use of texture lookups where in the old school WebGL1 you would have texture to the, So we did kind of a global replacement in the database. We replaced all the strings. But that, was, that wasn't enough because we were experiencing some crashes where uh, WebGL2 and WebGL1, I guess the ang angle, in angle, how was the name? Angle. Yeah, the underlying library that converts all these shaders into DirectX. Um, the implementation for GL2 and GL3, uh, GL2 and GL1 was different. And basically there were some issues with the, uh, the way derivatives are computed without, within loops, which are needed for mid mapping, and there's some technical reasons for, by which many of the shaders were crashing. But uh, so basically, we had to hand replace hundreds, if not thousands, of shaders. Uh, luckily, many people, because the point of shader toys is to learn from each other, many people copy from each other as well. Uh, and in particular, they copy often one of my noise functions that I use a lot to create procedural noise, like in this case, this galaxy that someone used. But chances are that he's using one of my noise functions. So because of that, we could still do kind of a global replace in the database and get 50% of the shaders converted. Um, besides that, everything else went relatively smooth. I, we had to write some uh, fallback functions for WebGL1 in case you are in Edge uh, and other Microsoft browsers, but that was fine. What we got and we are very excited about with WebGL2 is that now we have integer support, which is super important to create um, good noise functions that are uh, that work across platform. Before we were using, because we didn't have integers, we were emulating 
uh, randomness in the shaders by kind of creating aliasing by doing the frag or a sine wave of a huge number, which overflows things, and that was creating noise. But that was behave differently in different platforms. So I would be able to make, I was making a terrain landscape which would look different in Linux than in Windows. But now with integers, everything is stable. And the other big win is that um, we have things like texture. OK. All right. I will be just at 20 seconds. So we do have, um, uh, sorry, I can, we can also use, uh, we can index into local arrays, which is super useful to do things like stacks. In this case, this is a recursive, a recursive tree, which you couldn't do in WebGL1, but now because you can push and pop things from a local stack, you can create branching and things like that. Um, what else are we very excited? We have multiple render targets and texture 3D, uh, 3D textures, which means that in the next few months, we should be able to get, give you access to that, so you can pre-compute huge uh, distance fields in a 3D texture in the first pass, at least a low resolution version of it, and then on the render pass, you can look up the 3D texture to have fast ray marching and things like that. So it's super, super exciting. And this is an example of what you can do now with WebGL2 in a much more elegant way than in WebGL1. This is a whole game running in a fragment shader where all the game logic is happening, is made in GLSL. There is no JavaScript code here. It's all uh, yeah, GLSL code, which is supposed to be used for rendering, but you can also do game logic with it. And because you have uh, functions like textile fetch, you no longer have to do weird pixel UV manipulation where you add uh, half a fragment so somewhere divided by the resolution of the texture to access the proper unfiltered textile value. Now with textile fetch, which you do have in WebGL2, it's pretty elegant. So, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and sorry for the, the rush again. Uh, you're going to do fine, Sebastian. Don't rush. Don't worry. OK, we'll, we'll make it. OK, so uh, let's get you full screen. Let's get you presenting. You have your other, uh, other bookmark already in this yeah. browser. OK, yeah, so all right, very good. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm working at Microsoft, and I'm pretty lucky because I'm spending most of my time working on uh, WebGL and uh, BabylonJS. And I'm here today to present you our new release, uh, which we shipped around two weeks ago, uh, which is BabylonJS uh, 3.0. Just as a first introduction for the one of you who don't know BabylonJS, uh, it's both a rendering and a game engine. You can easily construct your own distribution on the website to use only the rendering feature if you need to, or you can use a full-on uh, game engine with sounds, physics, and so on. It's all WebGL and uh, JavaScript-based. Uh, we've got really two major concerns uh, on the Babylon team, which are simplicity and uh, efficiency for all of the code that people will write for it. Basically, we are trying to match one feature with one line of code. And a short line of code is kind of better in this case. Uh, we are trying to put everything open source. Uh, and even our tooling, we're really willing to share it with the community to ensure WebZGL as a whole is just growing and growing faster. We've got multiple tools, as we'll see later on during the presentation as well. In terms of feature for the new version, uh, we're really proud to have introduced uh, really nice support for uh, WebGL2 in standard. And we've got as well uh, WebVR 1.0 and 1.1 supporting in standard. I will detail them a little bit later in the presentation. We are also now revamped our PBR material to really match against the uh, GLTF uh, format 2.0 version, as you've seen probably previously in the GLTF uh, buff. In terms of WebGL 2, uh, we introduced in standard a few features for, uh, dedicated to performances, like uniform buffers, vertex array objects, which helps us reducing a lot the number of calls to your underlying context. We also added more quality features, like multiple sample render targets, which are really quite helpful in uh, WebGL. We also have the support for non-power of two textures. Uh, we've got a really nice automatic fallback from WebGL2 to WebGL1 for the same reason as that the uh, Toys guys explained earlier. Just supports really the broader range of platform available yet. And we also have an interesting feature, which is uh, we're able to upscale uh, the shader developed in WebGL1 to WebGL2 automatically. Just basically the same uh, 
find and replace for texture and so on, just to ensure we can really benefit from the performance of the browser running in WebGL2 by default without any harm for back compatibility for people who already developed experience. About WebVR, uh, we've got now a full support for 1.0 and 1.1. 1 .1. We are also supporting uh, in standard uh, fallback to uh, device orientation. So what we call device orientation is really like your cardboard experience. So if you're on a phone and you try to run a WebVR experience, what happens is we fall back directly to a cardboard experience to ensure the broader compatibility coming for free without any code required from the authority experience themselves. We've got also support for controller for HTC, Oculus, uh, GRVR, and we are currently implementing the one for the new incoming uh, VR controller from Microsoft. Now, we speak about tooling because it's really one point we're kind of proud of uh, at Babylon, and we're really willing to share this with the community. Uh, first, we've got our sandbox, which is here to help any designers who created assets in uh, GLTF or OBG files, they can buy a simple drag and drop, put it in the sandbox and see how it would look like inside of Babylon GS. As GLTF is now portable, it should give you a good feel of how it would look like on other engines as well relying on uh, GLTF. The feature I really value the most, and which is my favorite one, is the playground. Uh, it's really a place where, a little bit like Shader Toys for Shader, people can create quick uh, samples for Babylon JS directly inside of your browser. I'll use the playground later on uh, for the demo of Spectre. Also, as we've got like, I think it's around uh, 150,000 playgrounds today, we put it in place in our documentation website, a really nice way to search for any API directly inside of our documentation, and you will figure out and find a whole lot of uh, references for playgrounds which are relying on it. So you could see how other people are using it and feel free to just copy paste the code and reuse it inside of your own experiences. <coughs> Last but not the least, uh, this is the latest tools we introduced. So this one is not dedicated to Babylon only. Um, it's Spector.js. Uh, it's a tool which is able to help you capturing everything that happened under the hood in your uh, WebGL rendering context. So you can use it on any engine that uh, rely on uh, WebGL. Let me do a, just a quick demo of it. So this is the playground I was speaking about. So basically it's pretty easy. If I want to change the light intensity, for instance, I will just go there, run again inside of it. Everything works directly. It's really a quick way to iterate uh, inside of your uh, code samples. I will still take a model that looks a little bit better after starting after starting Spector. So I need to start Spector to capture what happened on the WebGL context because I don't want to hook everything before you request it. That's why I need to reload the page uh, one time. From there, I'll use a famous model that we've seen this morning quite a lot. And you'll be able to easily just capture from a browser extension everything that happened inside of your uh, WebGL context. On the left side, you can see all the visual states with clear command, for instance, creating this empty blue screen, rendering of the helmet, and then the rendering of the environment around it. From the middle column, you can see in a chronological order any single WebGL command that happened on your context, which is pretty handy, because if I take this draw call, for instance, that will select it automatically, I can see the visual state as well as all the information concerning your state, which was one of the major issues we were having when we were developing, because, for instance, the blend state was staying on and we wanted it to be false. Uh, you can also see any single attributes or uniforms that you're using, all the texture input, and so on and so forth. Another nice feature is the fact that you can directly see your shader source code here, which is quite handy when you want to deal with uh, define, for instance, as lots of people are modifying defines dynamically. It's quite useful to be able to see the one you're actually using uh, under the hood, as well as an information pen, which is just really giving you all the information you've got on your canvas and your context, where we can really see here that we are using the version 2 uh, of WebGL on this demonstration. Thank you. <laughs> Very much.
So uh, this is just a phenomenal contribution to the community, and uh, we've you know been sort of in, had a dearth of tools for quite a while, and Spectre JS in particular is going to have such a huge impact. It's uh, it's hard to overstate. Um, really uh, fantastic contributions from our, our friends at Microsoft, and uh, great to have such a vibrant community. So, uh, Tarek, please introduce yourself. And... Hi. Uh, oh, go for it. All right, uh, so yeah, I'm Tarek Sharif. I work at uh, Bio Digital, and I've been working lately just on, <clears throat> like as I've been exploring WebGL2 uh, tools and uh, some pedagogical tools just to help people who, like not just using WebGL2 through a library, want to actually kind of get into understanding how it works. So a bit about what we do, Bio Digital, we do these like big high detail anatomy visualizations. Um, so this base anatomy, which is kind of our core anatomy that we use across a lot of our content. Uh, 2,200 objects, 3.3 million tri triangles. Um, so a big thing we deal with is just the, the overhead of all those draw calls um, and, and how many objects that we, we tend to render on the screen. So some stuff that we're excited about from MGL2 is essentially the stuff that'll help us reduce that overhead, like UBOs, instance drawing, occlusion queries, like anything that'll help us draw less or reduce the overhead per draw call. Um, so as you know, Ken and a lot of people have talked about, WebGL2 is a pretty substantial update to the language. Like you have the new uh, shading language, you have these uh, UBOs, transform feedback, query object. Um, some stuff was available in WebGL1 through extensions. A lot of stuff is, is brand new. Um, so for someone who wants to get into it, it can be tricky. There's like, how do you get all these features to work together? So to that end, I, you know, to, to kind of aid me in my own experiments, uh, I created PicoGL. Uh, .js, um, which is, I've kind of created as a very thin layer just to manage the GL. Um, there's no math, scene graph, physics, or any of that stuff. Um, you're dealing kind of di directly with the GL con uh, constructs that you'd use if you're, if you're writing WebGL uh, too directly. Um, but PicoGL just kind of provides a friendly API, manages some of the trickier layout stuff, um, works around a couple of implementation bugs uh, I've come across that I know the, the vendors are working very hard to, to fix. Um, so just a quick example of what, you know, I don't know if that shows up that well, but like um, kind of what PicoGL code looks like. You know, create your app, which manages um, your GL state. You're creating a program, you're creating a VBO, you know, kind of bind it to a vertex array. And then the only sort of abstract level I have really is the draw call, which you, at a minimum, you have a program, vertex array, and then you use that to draw your scene. Um, and just a quick example of how I think uh, PicoGL makes it a little easier to, to work with these GL, uh, like some of these new constructs that are available in WebGL too. So UBOs, for example, really handy, like, for those who don't know, I'm not sure, but like, um, you know, in WebGL 1, you'd have to, when you're updating your uniforms, you have to update them each individually. Uh, UBOs allow you to just store all that uniform data in one block of memory, and then you just bind it um, kind of behind a uniform block and you up, update all your uh, uniform values at once. Um, but using it, you have to know, like, you have to set the byte offsets um, directly. You have to know the, the STD140 layout and make sure your stuff is aligned properly. Um, you have to set it to the right, you know, index binding of your uniform buffer and then make sure that your program is pointing to that. There's a lot of little details that can go wrong and be a little tricky. Um, with PicoGL, you just, uh, you basically just tell it, you say I want to have these types in this order in my uniform buffer, uh, and then you kind of update them as if it was like elements in an array, and then you just bind it to your, your uniform block in your program by name. Um, so that, oh, what happened here? There we go. So yeah, just a couple of demos of stuff that, you know, kind of show how these, these features can be used together in, <clears throat> so the WebGL2 features and like on the website they have um, it shows how to use PicoGL to kind of create these effects. I have one depth of field where I'm using depth textures and uh, instance drawing here. Uh, order independent transparency, um, where it's basically, uh, so it's using multiple render targets and float textures to get that. Um, occlusion culling, which I'm pretty excited about. So this one, I'll just turn it off for a sec so you see sort of what it's drawing, where I'm drawing kind of a grid of spheres, but when the occlusion culling is on, it doesn't draw the, the stuff that's being uh, blocked by other objects. Um, and this one, uh, features you've seen before, but this was just kind of fun, a GPGPU uh, cloth sim that's using uh, float textures uh, primarily. Um, 
And that's about it here. If anybody's interested in this stuff, uh, there's a website. All the source code is on GitHub. You can look me up on Twitter if you have any questions or email me. Um, and that's about it. 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> so uh, I'm Jing Mo from the Google Chrome GPU team. Um, this is a feature that uh, I've been hearing people asking ever since the beginning launch of WebGL, but uh, we um, never um, feel strong enough to implement it. But now WebVR is in place, and uh, you definitely um, don't want to exit the VR mode, then do something, then re-enter the VR mode. So um, this gives us enough motivation to finally implement this. It's basically rendering an iframe of all the DOM elements um, into a WebGL texture, so you can basically surf the web inside the VR mode, or even in any WebGL demos. So um, the overview is basically um, the reason we do this, there are a few benefits, um, a few applications. One is um, you can surf the web inside the VR, which would be really cool. And then also um, people invented many very creative ways to overlay um, DOMs on top of WebGL to give you a way to interact in, uh, with um, the content. And now you can just do it uh, organically inside the WebGL. You don't have to be very creative to do that. Um, here is the rough API. Uh, this is not even proposal because I just um, hacked this up in Chrome um, on Monday night. So, <laughs> um, so basically, there will be three functions. Um, first, you just call bind text source um, to bind the iframe to a texture. And this texture will be dynamically updating. So basically, you don't have to keep calling this binding function. Basically, when the iframe is updating, the texture will also be updating. Uh, and this is a read-only uh, texture, because if you write to it, then the rendering engine also write the iframe results to it, then that's going to be a disaster. I realized I didn't push the button, so it's like cheating. <laughs> So the, the second function, it's not exactly necessary, but it's nice to be there for optimization purpose, is um, the quest frame is basically, now we are seeing if you don't call this at each frame, then you don't update the, the texture. So this gives the um, rendering engine, like a browser, an uh, opportunity to, to know when you need to render iframe to the texture and when you don't. So uh, updating is not automatic per frame, it's on demand. So this gives you an opt uh, optimization opportunity. The last is basically um, you want to interact with uh, this iframe inside the WebGL. So um, you don't want to go back to the original iframe or you want to fake uh, layout this iframe because in WebGL you can be rendering the thing in a group or in a like, uh, cross or whatever shape. So um, there is no easy way to, to just lay out, uh, overlay the, the the iframe on top of that. So you have to be able to forward when you click uh, the texture inside the scene, and you need to know uh, which actually the point you click in the iframe, then forward the event to that. For this, I tried to get it working um, yesterday and failed. So, so today I'm not going to demonstrate the, the number three. So um, for this API, basically, we uh, give you a few guarantees. Um, Basically, you, one thing is you don't want to show a texture being rendered a half frame. Basically, you don't want, you, you want the, the entire iframe because um, rendering iframe to the texture, rendering iframe is asynchronous. Um, and then when you use that texture, it need, needs to be guaranteed that this texture is uh, the entire iframe, not like half the iframe or missing elements. And then basically with this request frame, another benefit from that is beyond, besides the optimization the, um, the browser can do, it's also when your request frame, um, in, a, in a single frame, in a request animation frame, um, from the beginning to before you call request frame again, you are guaranteed that texture is stable, is constant, it's not going to change. So basically you can use it, otherwise, if you render the iframe in multiple places in a scene, then if it's changed in the middle, then um, you're, you are going to get some unexpected effects. So this, uh, this API will guarantee it's stable 
until you call request frame, then you don't know when it's going to be updated. So there are, here are a few challenges uh, in implementing this. And first, the iframe can be as complicated as you can imagine the entire website. So um, basically, Chrome GPU team spent multiple years of how to render the DOM efficiently. Uh, we have accelerated compositing, rasterization, canvas, video decoding, and many features. And uh, so now we basically, we want to utilize all those nice features in rendering the iframe to the texture. You don't want to reinvent all the rendering um, and to the texture. So basically that means we, I have to wire um, this deep GPU stack when I implement this feature. Uh, this is uh, one of the challenges I'm facing. And second is, this is, a, this is the original reason why we didn't implement it a long time ago, is because of security concern. Because uh, for cross-origin content, um, First, we don't want the app to read back the content um, because then you can get uh, user-sensitive information. Um, even you don't allow it to be read back, just uh, some smart folks uh, write a shader, basically depending on the value of the pixel, they, they do different things then cause the shader to be executed in different timing. Um, that basically they can reconstruct the scene. And then people propose uh, WebGL security sensitive resources extension to forbid that. Basically, don't allow many things like conditions and, and uh, stuff to make sure those kind of timing attack is not possible. But then our NVIDIA colleagues informed us that even without the complicated shader logic, even just by simply reading the texture or writing to the texture, because of the compression of the pixels um, in the graphics drivers and hardware, you can already, uh, depending on the uh, content of the shader, you can already have a different timing. So um, now this is a problem we have to address before we can allow the uh, uh, cross-origin iframe to be used in WebGL. But uh, um, I think we can deal with this. And uh, sorry, we can deal with this um, and allow cross-origin iframe to be used uh, as a WebGL texture. So now let's see some demo. And uh, although I've been working on WebGL for seven years, I've never get to write anything other than conformance test. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my version of demo. <laughs> so that's the iframe on the right. On the left is the is the WebGL texture. So you can see it's not just the video feed, it's the entire UI and everything. So um, I showed it to my teammates yesterday and they feel like we should demonstrate something better. So um, my colleague Brandon Jones um, come up with a much better <laughs> demo. He hacked it until one o'clock in the morning to get it ready for you guys. So this is uh, much better. <laughs> so one more thing is my colleague Kai uh, hacked up this during lunch time. <laughs> so wait, oh, here. So basically it shows you how to actually away, because only the app knows uh, where the pixels are and how to uh, map that to the uh, DOM, uh, to the iframe coordinates. So this is a way, give you an idea, basically depending on the pixel color, then you can decide the coordinates, then forward the event um, to, the, to the iframe. But of course, forwarding needs to be provided um, API from the, from the, um, from the browser, you, from the UA, you cannot do it yourself. And even that, there is a security concern because you can, you can, you can, you can tell lies because the user can click yes, then you can fake it to the no button. So there is still security issues we need to uh, answer. And sorry taking extra time, but that's it. Thank you. That is awesome stuff. Uh, thank you, Mo. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Kai, for putting together a really awesome demo. I think that. Uh, Waving YouTube in the breeze definitely hammers the point home. Uh, that's the future of the web. It's, it's all three sheets to the wind. <laughs>
So um, all the presenters are in the front row, yeah, because we're going to have to do just-in-time scheduling here. So um, may we please present Will Eastcott from Play Canvas? And yeah, yeah, it's working. Okay, great. I think so. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Will. I'm uh, co-founder of Play Canvas. Uh, so most of you probably know what Play Canvas is already. Uh, if you don't, it's, uh, it's an online platform for building uh, web gel content. Uh, if Unity got together with Google Docs and GitHub, you get Play Canvas, basically. Um, and uh, it's open source as well. I should mention that. So if you go to GitHub, you can find uh, the, the whole engine on there as well. Um, so it's a game engine, right? So most of the content that you see made with Play Canvas today is games. And um, so this is just a selection, for example, of games that are published on uh, Facebook Instant Games, uh, which was a platform that launched last year. Um, so there's games here published by King, Zynga, and uh, there's even one from us, top left. And um, I mean, we're getting about 7 million MAUs at the moment, um, just with that game that took a couple of weeks to make. Uh, so WebGL games can have a massive reach, and it's, it's a really exciting new way for, for people to experience game content. Uh, but these applications aren't going to win any uh, awards for, for visuals. Um, and we're, I'm at SIGGRAPH, right? So let's uh, talk about something that looks a bit prettier. Um, and another part of this, uh, another sector that's doing some quite interesting stuff visually is um, uh, sort of product manufacturers, and these guys want to want to make uh, visualizations of their products, right? Uh, so, as an example, there's, there's a company called Polaris uh, that makes these crazy off-road vehicles, um, and uh, these guys wanted to pioneer the first, the world's first sort of um, vehicle configurator done in production, and uh, so they they set out to to make a prototype in in Play Canvas, and um, the the output of this scene. Um, is just embedded in my slides here. Um, and um, so you can see this was kind of the, the result of the first uh, foray into uh, doing realistic vehicles in, um, in Play Canvas for these guys. And uh, Play Canvas is a PBR engine, so it's got, it's got PBR, physically based rendering, built right into the engine. Um, and um, so if I just change the skybox, I can uh, see drastic changes in lighting. Uh, so that's all image-based lighting. Um, okay, so uh, once they've done that, they went into production. And um, if you go to, well, if you just Google Polaris Razor, uh, you'll see uh, their vehicle configurator, which is pretty exciting to see this kind of application uh, coming out from a vehicle manufacturer now. So you're going to see BMW and Mercedes and all the other ones doing it at some point, but these guys were first. Um, so um, this application is super uh, heavyweight, actually. It's, the, it's got like a... Uh, something like 50,000 entities in it. I mean, it's huge. It's one of the most complex applications made in WebGL uh, that you'll see. Um, and um, it's companies like this that are always forcing us to do more and more um, you know, interesting things and uh, push WebGL harder. Um, and an opportunity we had to do that earlier this year in January was um, uh, the launch of WebGL 2. So we had, we had Mozilla approaches uh, to build a, an application which would help launch WebGL 2. Um, and uh, so, so we, uh, we went away, we did some concepting, and um, uh, you can see some early concept art that we, we put together here to kind of, you know, like put our ideas down on paper. Um, so it's really supposed to be a futuristic landscape with crazy abstract architectural um, objects raise, you know, rising out of the, the floodwaters. And uh, we kind of presented that to Mozilla and um, then went off and made it. And while we were doing that, we tried to um, build as many you know, features of WebGL 2 into the engine and hence into the demo. Um, so you'll see uh, that running now. You'll notice actually it spends ages compiling shaders. Um, so I'm just going to kick it into high mode. Probably best not to do ultra on my poor laptop. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, if I just, you probably most of you have seen this, this demo, but I can kind of talk, around it, talk about it a, a little bit. So you can see there's leaves straight away swirling around in the wind. and. Um, What's happening there is we're using transform feedback to uh, uh, run like a little simulation of um, uh, that's, that's you know causing the leaves to move. Uh, also, <laughs> a little Easter egg. There's a character there with a coat that's got a full cloth simulation on it, but that's the only place in the entire demo you can see it. Uh, so it's, it's a bit, bit of a waste of time. <laughs> um, and then um, we use things like um, HDR render targets um, that are multi-sampled, and we use 3D, 3D textures. So uh, the clouds are all procedural. You can see them rolling across the sky there. That's all 3D textures. We used um, 
alpha coverage to do really nice foliage rendering, um, a whole bunch of WebGL2 features that are now standard part of Play Canvas. But we also have a bunch of non-WebGL2 features used in this demo as well. So for example, uh, we don't load light maps. We've got uh, 30 more seconds. Um, so we don't load light maps. We, we generate them when the demo starts. right? And that's a load time optimization, because it means we don't have to download megabytes of, uh, of light maps. Uh, and we also use uh, hardware texture compression formats like uh, PVR, ETC1, and uh, uh, DXC, which um, means that you can run this uh, pretty much on any device, although we have to take off. But anyway, uh, that's the next release that's coming out of this. Um, I'm going to leave you with the, uh, the final sequence of, of the app. I've just realized I don't have audio, but never mind. Um, we went to um, an, a really great composer. So if you haven't seen this demo before, then uh, I do recommend uh, loading it up and um, uh, listening to the beautiful audio. Uh, but I'll just let that finish playing. And we're done. So I hope you liked that. Um, that's everything from me. Thank you. Um, yeah, Play Canvas is making incredible distributed collaboration tools and uh, an amazing engine. And if you haven't checked out their stuff, I really encourage you to do so. It's, uh, they're, they're really pushing the boundaries of what you can do on the web. So. Uh, here is the man who hopefully needs no introduction, Mr. Doob, who is the man behind 3.js that some of you may have used. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear what's new. So thanks. All right. Uh, so I was trying to, well, I'm going to explain later. later. Like, I'm going to start by you showing this. Uh, Canada did this website for their 150 anniversary where they had this new build note on the, on the website. They had this uh, nice. Uh, 3D model of a new bill, and I really like the use of WebGL in this case. <clears throat> I don't have that much time for examples, so that's the only one I could pick as a random one. So, all right, so this is the, uh, the update for Secret 2017. Uh, basically, uh, this is seven year, and I was trying to like see, as an update, I was trying to see what kind of happened since the last update. It was basically GDC like three or four months ago. And there's actually a lot of things that happened since and the library since then, and it, and it feel a little bit bad that I cannot show everything that happened, but uh, I'm going like, to try to select some of those things. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, uh, Mujin uh, 87. We have been working a lot of, on, on reworking the loader for Colada. Like the previous Colada loader that we had was, uh, was consuming a lot of memory. And the new one uh, is much faster and consumes less, uh, less memory. This is just a simple example and kind of shows how quick kind of loads. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work 25 with the Colada spec which is still surprising these days. And we also been working on the Draco loader, uh, uh, trying to help a little bit the Draco team to um, move a little bit into the JavaScript world. They're more exp experts in C++ and trying to like, get them to do some, a, lo a loader and that use their technology easier for people. Uh, also, as we, on the previous talk on GLTF, we've been working on GL GLTF loader too, uh, to try to support uh, as best as we can the, the spec. Uh, also. Now we have a TDS loader. We cannot use three uh, at the beginning of, of functions, so it's TDS loader uh, for loading 3DS files. And also an X, <coughs> X loader for uh, X files using uh, DirectX. Uh, kind of like a minor thing, uh, something that's been going on uh, for a while is that we've been using this uh, multi-material kind of class whenever an object has different materials. We finally removed that. So now like the mesh material gets an array directly and that's much easier to serialize and much somehow like much uh, intuitive maybe. And that way we can finally load like a multi-material objects in the editor and modify them. Uh, then WebVR happened, kind of, and then it's, I kind of like gave a lot, a lot of priority to it and tried to um, really, I, I thought it was a good chance for like, Web, for like WebGL or like the web in, in basically to try to catch up to native. In this case, we were in a good spot this time to not, not get too far, uh, far away. Uh, so Google was um, 
kind of like tr promoting with the Chrome experiments as the video before. And then uh, <coughs> uh, Brandon did this talk at the Google I.O. Uh, also some months after, or some weeks after probably. And while he was showing how to do uh, web VR with three, I was kind of, I felt really bad because the API was really ugly on, on three. So I just went right away and I removed the um, VR controls of VR effect, which is what he was explaining how to use. <laughs> and <laughs> change it with a, a VR enable, or something that feels a little bit like easier and pe people don't have to care so much. Like you, you just do a scene and they just enable VR and then the, the engine does everything for you. You don't have to care about rendering each eye and like, you know, get the, the position of the uh, head and stuff. You can still do that and that's part of the challenge to do an API that, where you can still do all those things. And then I thought it was done, but then Steam background didn't work. It only was in one eye. And mirrors also like only didn't really work too, very well. And I'm still working on those things and trying to make it as easy as possible and integrate those things. Uh, <clears throat> for that, like, we started using uh, what's on before render. So now objects are going to start like having a, the objects now have like a on before render a function or method that is going to be called. So the, render, the object itself render itself, like in this case, the, the the mirror needs to like be able to know when it is going to be rendered, and then it renders itself through the scene. And it's kind of complicated, especially when it gets into two eyes. Also, it's all it's all recursive kind of thing. But it's it's very fun to debug. Uh, then we start to add on before to everything, so we also have on before compiled to the materials. So now we can hack a material itself. So even if you have a normal material, you can before it gets to compile the shader, now you can like twist it or like add whatever code you want into the shader is going to be compiled. Uh, then I've been like start doing some modularization of the code itself. So what you render in 2013 was uh, one file. Now it's 24 files, and probably going to be more. Um, but that has helped helped a lot. Like for web VR, we had to uh, they were going to need um, uh, context loss, uh, support context loss. It's something that we should have supported uh, for quite a while. It's going to it's going to ring in a, two seconds. All right. Um, that's something that we, sh we should have implemented like quite a while ago, but uh, which finally, like uh, now that everything is very modular, it was actually pretty easy to to implement. So whenever uh, you're doing any website, or you have like many websites in one tab, uh, for whatever reason, the system loose is not able to keep that website on. Like and whenever you go back in, then the website is going to reload itself, and it's going to the user will notice that anything that the system lost the resources. Um, then, uh, some people started to complain that the library is a little bit big. Which is actually not that big. It's like 130 kilobytes gzipped, but you know, there's <coughs> people that like you, it's, it's a good it's a good cause. Like try to like reduce as uh, the less as you can uh, to try to reduce how much data you're transferring. So the next thing that we're going to try to do is uh, try to move all the classes to or all the objects to ES215 classes. So that way, Rollup, which is the builder that we use, will be able to tree shake all the code to whatever the application is actually needed. And then I'm probably going to have to skip this, but like uh, well, this guy has been working on a path tracer, kind of using um, uh, the entity, kind of the engine, or like, well, it's, right now is a little bit hacky, but like, ideally, uh, eventually he will be able to like really parse the scene in three and like render uh, using a path tracer. Another scene, another example that was actually pretty realistic was with the, well, maybe that is too dark. And anyway, so kind of for ending, uh, as you know, like uh, last week, uh, Adobe announced that, and with all the browser vendors announced that uh, they were going to uh, discontinue a Flash in 2020. And I just wanted to say that thanks, obviously, to like Jonathan uh, Gay and Robert Tatsumi, which and Gary Gosman, which were the uh, he did Archon script, which were the guys that kind of like really push or like really develop the, the project from the beginning, and Adobe like went on top and all that stuff. But I just wanted to. Uh, first, thanks to say thanks to them because if it wasn't because of them, like probably many of us wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here for sure. As I come from Flash, uh, but at the same time, I think in this room, uh, I, will, I probably think that in, in this room, there's most of the people that um, we're going to be replacing what they left. And I think right now we're maybe probably like focusing focusing a little bit too much on the render quality, but not too much on the authoring tools. Playcam and iframe are doing a pretty good job on that. But I think we should like start to think a little bit more like you know, with Flash was very fun for people to do websites, and right now maybe we should start to now that we uh, we should also try to think about like doing tools for people to have fun doing this stuff instead of worrying that the transparency is not looking properly. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks.
Awesome stuff. Thanks, Ricardo. And uh, I mean, the, the impact that 3JS has had on the WebGL community, of course, can't be overstated. Probably like 80% of the sites out there um, that are using WebGL are doing it through, uh, through 3JS. So um, I do apologize to everyone because we're definitely going to run a little bit over. Uh, but I hope that it's worth it and, uh, and that, you know, this is exciting and that, uh, and that you can all stay for it. So please welcome Cedric from Sketchfab and they're going to talk about their awesome new rendering techniques. Hi, I'm Cedric from Sketchfab, uh, CTO and co-founder. Uh, so yeah, Sketchfab is a publishing platform for 3D files, discover and share. Today we are more than 1 million users, so it's big. And uh, I'll talk a bit about the update from the last uh, year. So we added like some support. Uh, we use MP3 because it works everywhere. Uh, and we can use it like for VR experience. You have like 3D uh, soon placed in the scene. So that's, uh, that's more interesting than no soon, especially in VR. Uh, we also uh, released with uh, a first web VR sh uh, shot. So, if it works. And if I have some. So it's better to watch it uh, in VR, but you will, uh, you will check uh, by yourself. Well, it's a bit long, so you will finish uh, with a link. Uh, so some uh, so, yeah, GLTF support is a big thing, and uh, we are very proud of that. It's very uh, important for the community, and also, uh, um, yeah, to be able to, uh, to export and import uh, more models. Um, but uh, it's good to have uh, models to be able to uh, download from Sketchfab, but sometimes you want to check the quality, uh, and we build uh, a new feature that should be released very soon. And uh, what it, uh, it helps to, uh, to inspect uh, the model, so it means that you can check each channel so, uh, and the UV coordinate. So you can be sure that when you download something and you want to touch it, it, re it will work as you want. Um, so, and so also you can check with uh, uh, post-processing, no post-processing, sometimes there's a big difference, so you can have some surprise. And um, yeah, so that's a, a very interesting tool, and also it helps for uh, artists to understand um, how some other artists are doing things. Uh, we also work on um, subsurface scattering, so it's something that was missing, and uh, artists wanted to have that. And um, so what it means is that we have a special shader for uh, for skin rendering. So we have, um, so we have uh, a model to, uh, to show that. So and, uh, it works with the different environment as uh, well. Well, probably it's better to uh, without the projector. Yeah, sometimes uh, artists are funny. Also, uh, it's not only used for uh, uh, skin rendering. You can also use for like translucency uh, object, so like crystals and things like that. So uh, I'm not sure you can uh, see the difference, but uh, the one on the right is like more translucent than uh, the one on the left. But yeah, still you need to uh, to check uh, for yourself. Uh, something that we also worked uh, this year, it was uh, anti-aliasing, uh, uh, adding a temporal anti-aliasing to the, to the viewer. Um, 
So the idea is like you use the previous frame to uh, um, uh, to make like a weight about the uh, the pixel color and uh, and uh, with multiple frame you are able to like uh, um, anti alias the image. So this is uh, an example. So the right part is uh, without temporal anti aliasing, and the left part is uh, uh, with it. So the uh, what it uh, why it's good is because when you move. When you move, you have a stable image, so it's uh, it's very uh, uh, better about quality uh, when you have animation. So I'll try to uh, speed up. Uh, also, camera limit. So now in the editor, you can uh, you can uh, select uh, some part of the model that you can uh, if if the artist uh, doesn't want that you go inside the model because he didn't uh, do it. You can just uh, have like some limit on the camera. Uh, also, um, matcap. So we we add matcap, but we it was not like you uh, you was not able to uh, to upload your own matcap. But now you can do it. Now you can do it, and uh, you ca you can assign a matcap on each materials. <coughs> and uh, also, we have now a way to uh, to browse uh, Sketchfab in VR. <laughs> So, like, uh, you can just browse Sketchfab uh, while you have your uh, your headset. And also, we implemented the new uh, spec about uh, uh, when you are on a web page, you can go in another web page, uh, keeping the uh, the VR context. We also released the mobile app. So it's uh, available for iOS and Android. So it works also with like uh, um, with VR support, and uh, we still use a, a, a web view inside, and it works pretty well. And um, the last thing is uh, ARKit. So we try to play it with ARKit uh, because uh, it's kind of easy, uh, and um, we probably will have it uh, in uh, our mobile apps uh, when it will be released. So. We hope so. And that's all. Uh, so Sketchfab just keeps getting better and better. And if any of you 3D artists out there haven't, you know, uploaded models to it and, and tried playing around with the material capabilities in the render, it's just it's getting incredible. And you know, the fact that you can run it on any mobile device is really stunning. Um, so hats off. So I'd like to introduce Xiao Jing and Ib from Uber, and they're going to show large-scale data visualization in WebGL. Hi, thanks everyone. So uh, my name is Xiao Jin and this is Yip. We come from the Uber data visualization team. So for anyone that's not that familiar with uh, data visualization, we basically help people making sense of their data. So uh, today we're talking about how to accelerate in data visualization using WebGL 2.0. And uh, just before uh, this week, uh, we announced that we released actually the data visualization frameworks that's using WebGL2, and it's a framework suite, so it, con it consists of DECGL, LumaGL, and also a React MapGL. Uh, you guys can check it, uh, so it's open source as GitHub, so you guys can scan the code and check the, the, the code. Uh, and the DECGL v v4.1 that we just released is actually a layer-based geographic uh, information visualization framework, so uh, for any uh, geographic data that you want to put on top of a map that, uh, and want to see what it looks like, you can try DECGL. And it's, uh, it follows the decorative programming kind of like a pat pattern, so that is super easy to use. And all the layers in DECGL is actually packaged as a React component, so it's very super easy to use. And the LumaGL is actually the rendering engine or rendering framework uh, be uh, below it. And it's a lightweight WebGL2 framework that is uh, 
very lightweight uh, wrapper around WebGL2, but we do have kind of uh, like the extension and feature management built in so that you don't worry about, you, you don't need to worry about uh, running them cross platform on WebGL1 or WebGL2 platforms. And you can also scan the code and check it. It runs on your phone, I guess. And also, uh, so thanks for everyone that makes WebGL2 actually in a reality because all the features that's added to WebGL2 actually has a tremendous impact to the data visualization uh, community. Like transferring feedback, as we will show later in the demo, that uh, helps that uh, significantly increase the kind of like the uh, effect, uh, the, the uh, efficiency of the data visualization. So next I will turn the uh, laptop to Ib so that he can demo some of the things that we're currently working on. So uh, we have uh, lots of um, uh, demos on the DeckGL site demonstrating the different layers. Uh, the basic idea is you put in, uh, you know, and typical JSON payload and array, give some accessors, describe uh, how to extract things like positions and so on. Uh, elevations, colors, and so on. What we've done here with, this is a WebGL2 specific uh, uh, demo that we have, so you can see it's overlaid on top of a map, and we have um, uh, basically a wind map. We load uh, data, weather data, uh, from, uh, and we have various weather stations that form a uh, kind of a grid that we uh, triangulate, and you can see uh, here with elevations and so on. And then on top of that, then we can calculate, uh, we, we generate particles, and with then based on the um, data on the winds and the directions and so on, we create, we basically have transform feedback and show these particles moving along the kind of forming corridors uh, where the wind patterns across uh, the country is. And it's all uh, then, uh, you know, overlaid on a map. It's completely interactive. It's support perspective mode. Uh, so there's really very little the application has to do to get something like this uh, uh, working. Um, <coughs> Yes, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, I think it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a GPU, GPGPU type technique that we use here. So you have all these weather stations and you need to create this vector field that will drive the particles and you need to interpolate between all these different weather stations. And so, you know, obviously the GPG, <laughs> GPU is very good at interpolating triangles. So we do a Delaunay triangulations of all the, of all the weather station uh, vertices and then we basically uh, you know, assigned to the vertices the, the speed and the direction uh, of, the, uh, of the wind, and then we basically render that into a, um, you know, a texture, which we can then sample, sample from, and then the GPU automatically uh, interpolates between uh, the weather stations. So it's kind of neat. Um, and then we're uh, packaging this up as reusable layers. So this is a vector field layer that basically you can use if you have this data to, to to visualize you know, locally in various points. And uh, this is the particle layer then that will dynamically render uh, particles according to the vector field. So again, everything's composable uh, in, in DECGL. And the final thing we wanted to show is we uh, are pushing DECGL beyond map. There's InfoVis use cases, but we're also doing hybrid type uh, applications. This is an example of a point cloud layer. And um, the So this is uh, something that we're focusing now on doing visualizations for our, auto this is our self-driving cars, our autonomous vehicles that are already running, as you know, in a couple of cities. And um, so this is the data that the vehicle sees. It's all built on top of DECGL, so it's actually composable uh, layers. There's a lot of work that's gone into this. It's hybrid, it's on top of the map, down to centimeter precision. Um, and um, you can see it handles a lot of, um, you know, uh, sea fighting and other things that you would have to deal with here is automatically taken care of by the framework. So, um. yeah. So this is the the team member. So uh, and uh, so we're visualization at Uber. So thank you. So if you've got big data and you need to visualize it, you should totally check out deck.gl. Uh, they've thought through how to make the visualizations efficient and use the latest features, and uh, the, the wind map is just so beautiful. So uh, last but certainly not least, 
We have uh, Diego from a the A-Frame team at Mozilla, and he's going to show us uh, some really happy, fun stuff, I'm sure, because their demos are always ha super happy and fun. Yeah. Now you're looking for a video? Yeah. Okay, so that's it. No. This, was, this is why we had the AV check this morning. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't have H. I'm, I may be able to get H. Yeah. Can we use a Mac one? You have a display port? Too? Yep. Okay, we got one. Okay, yeah, it's gonna work. Thank you. So thank you for having us. Uh, it's our first, uh, can you see over Okay, I will show it like that. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's our first um, participation in, in, at Seagraph, so I feel we, we made it. And uh, I'm going to talk about A-Frame. So A-Frame is a web framework to, to build VR content, and uh, we've been working on it for a couple of years already. We have seven, six major, major releases, 177 contributors, uh, more than 6,000 stars on GitHub, 4,000 members on the Slack channel, and hundreds of featured projects on the weekly blog. So in a nutshell, like A-Frame is a declarative entity component API on top of HTML. I'm going to show you how it looks like. So basically, you have an ASIN tag that you can fill with entities. In this case, I'm going to create like a GL, GLTF model that I can load from, from the network. And it's going to pop up there. And I'm going to use like a third-party component called environment that lets you like to set up a like quick uh, environment for, for rapid prototyping. Uh, and yep, in three lines of HTML, you have a scene. Um, so we have, as I, as I said, we had like uh, hundreds of, of uh, community-created com uh, experiences already, and I'm going to go very quickly for um, throughout a few of them, but we've seen them in the last couple of years. So uh, we have a wide spectrum of, of kinds of content. We have journalism. In this case, it's, a, it's an experience that shows the, the effects of the viral bombs in, uh, thrown during, during the, the war of Syria. Uh, we have uh, the journey to Mars that allows you like to roam around Mars with with one of the rovers. Uh, we have like uh, build, um, world building tools like like City Builder. Uh, we have data visualization tools. Um, we have gaming. Uh, we have uh, uh, UI prototyping in VR. Uh, we have math visualization. Uh, we have entertainment. This ghost train was was done for for the Halloween for last Halloween in. Uh, uh, um, yeah, for the last Halloween, last year. Uh, we have uh, our own version of Tilbras that are running in the browser. Uh, we have like productivity apps. This is the, the version uh, of uh, screen VR in, in the browser. Uh, we have augmented reality. Uh, we have like uh, higher level tools for, for non programmers. Uh, we also have like shaders. People are importing Shader Frog and, and Shader Toy into A Frame, so you can use the shaders in, in VR. Uh, we have real estate, so people that are doing like real estate tours, uh, so you can like have 360 panoramas of the apartments. Uh, we have education. This is called Cadaver that lets you let, that lets <laughs> that lets students like to <laughs> to explore the human body in VR. Like <laughs> uh, we also have multi-user experiences. This one is from Google VR. It's like a, it's an application that lets you like create music uh, with friends in VR. Uh, we also have like film festival movies like Broken Night, uh, like a 360 movie, interactive movie that they. Uh, they, they presented at, at the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, and this is from yesterday. This is a, a Google Blogs uh, Explorer. Actually, I can run pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, this is, you pass the URL of the, of, the, of the model created with Google Blogs. Yeah, you can pan, and you can actually uh, change the environment. Uh, yeah, and you can just, yeah. Visualize the different models created with, with, with Google Blogs. Um, yeah, going back to the slides. And uh, what's new? 
So I'm going to just highlight a few of the new features in the new version of A-Frame. We have link traversal, so you can, you can interconnect pieces of content using portals, and you can seamlessly navigate from site to site without taking your headset off. Uh, we have motion capture tools, so you can actually uh, capture your motion in VR. So you can uh, do VR development without having a headset because you can replay your, your, uh, the user interaction in VR, so you can iterate over, over your um, experience without having a headset. And lastly, uh, we're going to have like a mixed reality workflow, so you can do these kind of videos, like comp compositing like uh, um, yeah, virtual and real images. So, and last thing. WebVR is shipping in a week in Firefox 55. Yeah. <laughs> 13 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome job, man. Yeah. <laughs> in extremis. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Whoop. Oh. Just in time. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. We're over time. Uh, we got to let the. Whoop, 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 whoop. Don't. That, uh, that was your power. Um, we got to clear the room for the next boff to get set up. So please come to the Kronos after party tonight. Looking forward to meeting you all and uh, hearing what you're working on and uh, just touching base. Thanks again for coming. Bye.